Friends, may God's grace and peace be yours in abundance on this beautiful Sunday morning. I welcome you to worship with First Presbyterian Church, and I am delighted that God has gathered us together for worship, and I'm delighted that you have tuned in this morning. I have just a couple of announcements. I invite you to our coffee time following worship via Zoom from about 10 to 10.30. So if you weren't able to participate last Sunday, I invite you to come this Sunday. We had a wonderful time catching up with one another, and it's just a time of fellowship and sharing in our lives together. Also, the results of our survey are now available. Uh, There was a video that was produced, um, and it is on the homepage of our website. So if you are interested in learning about the results of of the survey, just visit our website, and it's on the homepage. And now let us call ourselves to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on God's name. Make known God's deeds among the peoples. Sing to God. Sing praises to the Lord. Tell of all God's wonderful works. Glory in God's holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Friends, let us rejoice and worship God. Friends, God calls us to do good, to care for one another, and to follow God's life-giving commandments. But we all fall short of who we are called to be, hurting those we love and worshiping idols that never offer what they promise. Nonetheless, God is merciful and abounding in steadfast love. Therefore, we can humbly, honestly, and bravely confess our sin before God, confident that God's forgiveness frees us from our sin. Let us pray together. Lord of wind and waves, creation and creatures, your power is at work everywhere, stilling the storms, offering peace, lifting us up from the depths of our greatest fears. You come to us immediately when we call, and yet we still lack faith in your ability and your will to work within and around us. We get distracted and afraid, focused on that which threatens us, rather than on the one who saves us. We act out of a sense of scarcity, as if there is not enough of your love, your grace, and your abundant goodness for everyone. 
And in our anxiousness, we hurt those entrusted to our care. We injure the earth we are to steward, and we sometimes fail to tend your sheep. Forgive our failings and our mistakes, and in your mercy, O Lord, reform us into the people you call us to be, those blessed to be a blessing. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Scripture tells us that those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, that no one who believes in Jesus will be put to shame. Trusting this sure promise, we rejoice that God hears us and forgives us. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, you are a new creation. The old life has passed away, and a new life has begun. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Amen. Friends, good to see you today. I'm going to talk about a device that many of you, I'm sure, have used. I'm sure your mom and dad use it multiple times a day, and you might have brothers and sisters or friends that use it. It's this remarkable, handy device, a cell phone. Think of the things that you can do on this thing. You can play games on it. You can go on the Internet and surf uh, the uh, web on it. You can go use a calculator now for those who are math challenged like myself. My son Matthew, in fact, loves going on here and checking out the toy reviews on YouTube, believe it or not. Um, you can get directions on this. You can get recipes on this and, and, and text people and email people. It just goes on and on and on. There's just so many apps. There's apps for apps. Uh, amazing. Uh, there's also another thing that you can do on this that I've heard. You can actually make a phone call. Isn't that incredible? We can even still do that on our cell phones. So today we're talking about how we can communicate with people and the different ways we can communicate with people. We can communicate like I'm doing right now by verbally talking with, with words coming out of my mouth. Uh, there's nonverbal uh, communication such as waving or stop or, you know, thumbs up, okay, a hey, okay. Um, that there's also written language that we can write someone a letter or write someone an email. In today's Bible passage, Jesus communicates with his disciples, and things don't go as the way... It should. We're reading the story of walking on the water with Jesus here. The disciples were just waking up on their boat. They had been on the water all night. Yawn! Stretch! It was so early, the sun wasn't even up yet. Andrew rubbed his eyes and looked into the fog. Hey! He whispered. You see what I see way out there? Oh, looks like a ghost to me. James cried out in fear. The disciples were shaking in their sandals. They were terrified. Through the fog, they can see the outline of a person walking on the water. It was Jesus. Don't be afraid. It's just me, Jesus, he said. He waved a friendly hello. There's your nonverbal waving. If it's really you, Jesus, tell me to walk on the water, Peter said bravely. Okay, Jesus shrugged. Come out here, Peter. The water's fine. Nope. Peter swallowed hard. He placed one foot into the water. 
Flop! He didn't go under. He tried the other foot. Flop! He was standing. He kept his eyes glued on Jesus as he took a few careful steps. He walked faster and faster. Splish, splash, splish, splash. Only his feet were getting wet. Jesus smiled at him. Peter felt the wind blowing on his face. He took his eyes off of Jesus and looked up at the dark clouds. He suddenly felt afraid. Uh Uh-oh, his ankles were getting wet. Uh Uh-oh, his knees were getting wet now. Peter was sinking into the water. Help me, Jesus. Save me, he yelled. Jesus reached out his hand and pulled Peter out of the sea. Why did you stop looking at me? Jesus asked, holding tightly to his friend. Don't you trust me? The wind stopped. They climbed into the boat full of cheering disciples. Hooray! This proves it, they said. You really are the son of God. From that day on, the disciples were excited to tell everyone they met about the power of Jesus. So yes, Jesus is powerful and incredible. But what happened to Peter there in the story? Yes, he stopped focusing on Jesus and looked down to see where he was in the middle of the water and started to be afraid. He started to not believe in what Jesus can do for him. For Jesus gave him the instructions and communicated with him that he would be okay. And as soon as he stopped believing, he started sinking. There are so many different ways we can welcome Jesus into our lives by through other people, by going to church, by going to Sunday school, by listening to children's time, by listening to your mom and dad talk about Jesus and their faith in Jesus. We simply need to listen and believe that Jesus is there for us. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving God, you are there for us. We needed us to focus on you and let everything else just disappear. That you are the most important thing in our life. And as long as we focus on you, we can get through our difficult times. And that we pray. Amen. We'll see you next time. God bless.
And now as we turn to God's word for us this morning in scripture, would you pray with me? How beautiful are the feet that bring good news. We are eager, Lord, to hear your good news, to listen to the gospel proclaimed, and to be changed by it. Open us to the leadings of your Holy Spirit that we might hear, believe, and share your saving word. Amen. Our first scripture passage this morning comes to us from Psalm 105. Listen for the word of God. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to God. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in God's holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles and the judgments he has uttered. O offspring of his servant Abraham, children of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He is mindful of his covenant forever, of the word that he has commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying to you, I will give the land of Canaan, as your portion for your inheritance. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our focal text is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. Jesus walks on the water. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat battered by the waves was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking towards them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You have little faith. Why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Would you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Wind and water can be life-giving or life-taking. We've seen that in many places throughout the world with floods and tsunamis and tropical storms. Here in the desert, we know how important water is to sustain life. And yet we've also seen how quickly a flash flood can take lives too. We've seen the power of wind and water unleashed this week as Hurricane Isaiah coming up the coast, leaving wreckage in its wake. 
And in my home state of Michigan, we see it each summer with tragic deaths from drownings in the Great Lakes. So far this year, there have been 51 drownings in the Great Lakes, and over half of those have occurred in Lake Michigan. One of my colleagues back in Michigan, in addition to being a pastor, is a scuba diver. He lives near the Big Lake, as we fondly call it, and he volunteers with the local fire department. He's the one they call to go dive for the bodies, to recover the drowning victims. The power of water is undeniable. And when it's combined with the power of wind, it's also unpredictable. Now, a lot of Jesus' ministry took place around wind and water. The Sea of Galilee is known for its unpredictable squalls that rise up quickly, causing fear and trepidation for those out at sea. In this morning's reading, Jesus finally gets his alone time, his time to commune with God in prayer. He sent the disciples off in a boat, and he went up the mountain to pray, alone at last. We're not given the details, but it sounds like the disciples had a very rough night at sea, battered about in the boat by high winds and crashing waves. Initially, they were headed toward the other shore, across from the feast of fish and bread. But it doesn't appear that they ever made it there, because as morning breaks, they are still at sea. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in rough waters, but after an entire night of it, I would probably be overcome with anxiety and fear. And on top of that, to then see what appears to be a ghost walking on water, I too would be terrified, probably terrified that I was losing my mind. But encountering Jesus can be terrifying. Now, after a long, rough night at sea, when the disciples look out on the horizon early in the morning and see a figure that appears to be walking on water, they were terrified, so terrified that they cry out in fear, but not too terrified to put Jesus to the test. Peter It's always Peter, right? Peter says, If it is you, Lord, command me to come to you. So Jesus plays along. Okay, Peter, come. Always wanting to show his obedience, no sooner does Jesus say the word and Peter hops out of the boat and starts moving towards Jesus. But... But then he looks around, he takes stock of the situation, he somehow suddenly notices the very strong wind. He becomes frightened and full of doubt. But at least Peter has the presence of mind to cry out to Jesus, Save me, Lord, as he begins to sink, to settle into the sea. I wonder how often we too are terrified when we encounter Jesus. Maybe we're scared that Jesus asks too much of us, that Jesus might call our comfortable lives into question and toss us back out to sea. Jesus might call us to self-examination, and we might not like the results of that exam. Jesus might call us to care for the least, the lost, and the littlest among us. Those who we'd really rather pass by on the other side of the road. As the great Methodist pastor and preacher Will Willimon writes, that's actually how you will know it's Jesus 
Jesus is the one who extravagantly, recklessly commands you to leave the safety of the boat, to step into the sea, to test the waters, and to show what your faith is made of. That's Jesus, he says. Do you know the beautiful hymn, Softly and Tenderly? It's sung at many a funeral, and one of my dearest friends sang it at my ordination, actually. Williman continues. He writes, Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me, goes the old gospel hymn. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling you in today's scripture to risk your life, to throw caution to the wind, to step out of the boat. Phew! If the disciples understood this, no wonder they were terrified. Now, I wonder what terrifies you about getting out of the boat and moving towards Jesus. What strong winds frighten us and cause us to doubt, to doubt ourselves or to doubt our mission? What causes our spirits to sink or makes us feel battered and blown about? Can we reach towards Jesus to be our buoy? Now, it occurs to me in reading this passage that Peter had probably never before tried to walk on water. Why would he? But he sees Jesus and he wants to move towards him. Now remember, Peter's had quite a couple of days bearing the beheaded body of John the Baptist, assisting Jesus with his healing ministry amidst throngs of people, and then miraculously feeding these same crowds with what seemed like just a measly portion. All of that topped off by being tossed about at sea all night with 11 of your closest friends in the too tight quarters of a battered boat. We like to give Peter a hard time, but I'm not sure if after all of this, I would have the gumption to try something new to hop out of the boat on what I knew to be rough waters, and to run towards Jesus. Most of us, I think, are more cautious than that. For all his faults, Peter didn't wait. He didn't wait until the storm had passed, until life had calmed down, until everything was peaceful and decently in order. He didn't wait until he had all of his ducks in a row, until it fit into his five-year plan. No, he simply and quite faithfully walked towards Jesus. You see, Jesus stretched his faith and his capacity, and Peter responded, not without fear and trembling, not without a measure of doubt, But Peter responds. He takes a risk. He moves towards Jesus. He tries something he's not sure he can do, something with no guarantee of success. It may be with fear and trembling and doubt, but he's moving forward. He's getting closer to Jesus. I think we could learn something from Peter. We too are being tossed about as storms rage on in our world. Some are feeling pretty battered, no doubt. The times are tumultuous. But we dare not wait to walk with Jesus. God is counting on us to continue Christ's mission. Maybe we, like Peter, are being called to try something new, to explore a new way of walking in faith, of walking in newness of life. We know that there's been a seismic shift, and some aspects of life prior to 2020 may never return, 
or at least not for a very long time. We are entering something new, and it can feel a bit terrifying. But even when we doubt ourselves or our abilities, the outcomes of our ministries or the reactions of others, Jesus still says, come, come to me. So what might our walking with Jesus look like in this new season? What compelling and creative ministry might we develop so that more people can get into the boat with us, joining us in worship and praise of our Lord, proclaiming as the disciples did when they were all back in the boat, truly you are the Son of God. What new thing are we being called to as a congregation, as the very body of Christ? How might we be a life-giving community to those in our midst? What could a cup of cold water look like? How can we sail with the Spirit as our guide, helping others to encounter Jesus as we have? We've surely got an abundance of resources and no shortage of talent and great ideas. I want to share some of the ideas that I've heard tossed about. Maybe a community garden out in our back 40 to build relationships with and feed our neighbors. A tutorial in tilling the earth. Or in that same space, maybe a labyrinth and a prayer walk to provide a place of solace in our community and foster a connection, a deep connection with Christ. Or maybe a bunch of tiny houses to provide shelter to the homeless who frequent our campus. How about a clothes closet to supplement the food pantry? Wouldn't it be wonderful to help someone pick out an outfit while they're picking up their groceries? Or how about providing mentors to the many people served by Mesa Presbyterian Ministries? There is so much strength, talent, and experience in our midst. And these folks need more than a rent payment. They need someone to care, to come alongside them, to cheer them on, and help them navigate the deep waters of life. Many of them are in over their head, and they need both a helping hand and a caring heart. Now, Jack and Yvonne, Brent and the others involved, they do an amazing job. And with the initiative of Bob Gerlach many years ago, they have created a very fruitful ministry. And, and there's always, always more that can be done, right? And so leveraging the power of relationships and guided by the power of the Spirit, the constant tossing about in many people's lives could maybe be calmed just a little bit. You see, Jesus is always stretching us, calling us out of complacency and more deeply into compassion compelling us to share the love of Christ in tangible, life-giving ways, ways that have a true and lasting impact on the very real lives of our neighbors in need. We don't have to have it all together first. We don't have to wait until the seas are calm and the wind has subsided. I fear we would be waiting a very long time. We don't have to have it all figured out either. No, Jesus calls us to risk, to stretch, to come out of the shallow safety of the boat and into the depths of life. We're not called to what was, but to what could be. So in this interim time, until we are once again gathered together, while you are alone on a mountaintop in prayer or even being tossed about at sea, know that Christ is already there and Christ bids you come. 
As you spend time in prayer, ask God what new thing you are being called to try. What risk are you being called to take for Christ's sake? What winds and waves might you help to calm? How are you being stretched and for what purpose? For whose purpose? How might we more closely walk with Jesus in this new season of our life together? Because again, we're not being called to what was, but to the possibility of what could be. And we've actually done a lot of new things this year at FPC Mesa. Online worship and coffee time, Zoom meetings and small groups, book groups and Bible studies, online devotionals and family-centered resources for faith formation, virtual choir pieces, and even, I think, soon virtual choir practice, We have certainly been stretched, and I think we've all learned some new things. I know I have, and I hope there's more in store for all of us. I pray that we've learned that we can actually do far more than we ever expected, and that God is indeed with us always. God is faithful to God's promises in Scripture In Psalm 105, we are reminded of God's promises and of God's faithfulness, God's covenant to be our God. God is mindful of his covenant forever, sings the psalmist, of the word that God commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to Israel as an everlasting covenant. And so trusting in God's covenant with us, we are called to give thanks to God, to sing God's praises and to make God's deeds known among our neighbors, those in the apartments and those in the park, those who wander through our campus. We are to tell of God's wonderful works not just when we feel like it, and not just when we are young. No, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek God's presence and continually make God's love known. This is what it means to be the body of Christ on earth, to be the boat that is the church, a place of refuge certainly, but also a people on the move, in the very midst of the wind and the waves, in the heart of the storm, stepping out of the boat and sharing Christ with others. Compelled by compassion to be in community with our world and in communion with God, courageous and caring in our faith. Jesus leads Peter, and in so doing, leads us, not over the tumult or out of the tumult, but rather right straight into the tumult of life, asking us to stretch and risk for the sake of the good news, asking us to do a new thing, and even to dwell a little bit in our discomfort so that all might know God, might be swept up in the Spirit, and might walk with Jesus, the only one who walks on water. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. And now would you pray with me? Lord God, as we navigate strong headwinds and seek you to see through our fatigue and our fears, we confess that you are truly the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the one who stills the storm and immediately reaches out your hand to keep us from drowning. 
We rest for a moment in the joy of your presence, no longer afraid, free from anxiety, assured that you do not and will not leave us alone. But you seek us out when we are most in need of your peace. We know, Lord, of all that none of our thoughts and hopes, our doubts, our worries are off limit to your care and your compassion. We know you, our teacher and our friend. You welcome us as we are, and you hear whatever is on our hearts and our minds. We ask you to hear our prayer for those in our midst most battered by the storms of our time. Grab the hands of those about to go under the waves of poverty or financial crisis. We ask for your intervention on behalf of families unable to provide basic necessities for their children, those wrestling with food insecurity, those on the cusp of eviction, and the unemployed facing the end of benefits. As we see those about to be swamped by the waves of this pandemic, move us to act in ways that lift others up out of the roiling sea. Reach out and give courage and strength to people in leadership positions. Grant them wisdom your wisdom, Lord, to make decisions in the best interest of the most vulnerable. Inspire communities to use their power and resources, their will and gifts, to support people on the margins, those for whom this difficult season has been catastrophic. Lord, we pray for teachers, administrators, parents, and students as they all seek to navigate a new school year rife with uncertainty and unprecedented in challenge. We are mindful of essential workers who are facing the danger of this public health crisis every day. Protect and sustain them, Lord. We lift up the sick and the, all those who suffer. Give them hope, bring relief, surround them with your mercy, and hold them close in your loving care. Quiet the dangerous wind of discord and division, and stir up the breath of the Holy Spirit to heal and unite us. Help us to build up the body, strengthen our witness, and reveal to the world that we follow the one who commands us to love one another. May others look at your church and see your hands at feet at work in the world, feeding and tending, forgiving and repairing, doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with you, our God. In this moment, Lord, we rest in your presence, certain that you are our Savior, and indeed the Savior of all the world, able to do abundantly more than we can ever hope or imagine, never far from us, always reaching out your hand to save us when we fear the wind and waves of life will overtake us. We worship and praise you as we pray the prayer that you taught all disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Gracious God, you call us to let go of the things we cling to and step out in faith, trusting in your love and your provision. Give us courage to step out boldly in sufficient faith to follow without fear. 
encourage us to be cheerful givers so that your kingdom might be known on earth as it is in heaven. Let us prepare our heart and soul for our tithes and our offerings. Please join me in the prayer of dedication. God of grace and glory, your Son Jesus gives victory over life's most violent storms. We pray and bless strength in our faith as we commit ourselves to the path you call upon us. Accept our gifts, our time, our talent, and our treasures. Bear us up before you and before all to whom you send us so that everlasting praise and glory may be ascribed to you through Christ's most excellent name. Amen.
friends, as we close our time of worship, empowered by the Spirit, may we be a calming and peaceful presence in the storms that are raging on in people's lives and in our world. And so as we go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace both now and forever. Amen.